Well, we welcome all here this morning and trust that the day has been good to you so far, and we're thankful that we'll be able to bring you this lesson. I'm going to use as a text this morning, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. After I read those passages, then I will zero in on what topic we're going to study in this sermon. Again, Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. The writer pens, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Again, for anyone just tuning in, that's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. I want us to note specifically what is in verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Now you must remember the reason for the writing of this letter. We've said it many times, but we'll say it again. First of all, most of the letters of the New Testament are written to Christians concerning how to live the Christian life, exposing error in their lives, teaching them the kind of life they are to live, and so forth and at many times rebuking them, admonishing them to change their ways to follow the teachings of the gospel. As we look at this particular letter, it's written to Jews who had become Christians. They had believed the gospel, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ as the Son of God, and been immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of their sins, and the Lord added them to the church. Just read Acts chapter 2, the record by Luke of the church beginning and see how people became members of the church, and you will see that. And by the way, becoming a member of the Lord's church is the same as becoming a Christian. You don't become a member of the church Jesus built and purchased with his blood, Matthew 16, verse 18, and Acts uh, 20, and verse 28. You don't become a member of that church without having your sins forgiven and become a Christian. It's synonymous to say that you became a member of the church and you have become a Christian. So he's writing this letter because they're under persecution. Now, no doubt it had to do with the unbelieving Jews or whatever along that line. And they were actually thinking about going back under Judaism, back under the law. So the book was written to show them that the law was a shadow of good things to come, that there is not going to be another kind of religion offered after the Christian religion, the New Testament system of salvation. At the end of the Christian age, the world will end. All men will be brought into judgment and consigned to either heaven or hell according to the way they lived here. So he reasons with them like that throughout the book, trying to show the purpose, the design, and the end of the law of Moses and the design and purpose, therefore, of the Israelites as a fleshly nation. Once Christ came in the flesh from Israel, the tribe of Judah, the family of David, and fulfill the redemptive plan, then there's no more need for an Israel as we read of it in the Old Testament. But these had believed the gospel like those old Pentecost. And they were now being tempted to give up Christianity. So what does he say to them in verse 36? For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise, Hebrews 10, 36. Now, we want to zero in on that word patience. We use it many times in a different way today than it's used in the scriptures. The English word patience has the idea of enduring or endurance. It has the idea of perseverance. All these words translate the same Greek word, the very word the Holy Spirit caused the inspired writers to use, and that's hupomone. Hupomone, that's a compound word. It's um, in the Greek a feminine noun. And the actual definition of hupomone is a remaining behind, 
a patient enduring, endurance, steadfastness, patient, waiting for. It's kind of interesting that when you go to see a physician today or a dentist, that you have a waiting room. And you may have an appointment to see the doctor at 1030, but you may not see him to 1130, and you endure. You wait to see the doctor to hopefully get an answer to whatever it is that caused you to go to him in the first place. But you sit there and you wait. You may want to be somewhere else. You may be looking at your watch and you would like to be somewhere else and you may have another appointment. But overall, in most cases, I know you can cancel it, but in most cases you have that appointment and even if you're late, you wait. You patiently wait. You endure the waiting. You persevere to be able to see the doctor. Now, hupo, that's one of the compound words, means under. Under. It's a preposition, actually. And mino means remain or endure. It is properly remaining under endurance, steadfastness, and especially in our interest here, as God enables the believer to remain or endure under whatever burdens are coming his way, especially if it's because he's faithful to Christ. Now, every person being a human must endure the affairs of this present world. But when you become a Christian, you're told plainly, as Paul did to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The particular endurance we're talking about and the scriptures are talking about, especially in Hebrews 10, 36, you have need of patience, is the idea that because you're doing what's right, what the Bible teaches, you're being persecuted for it. Now, what do you do about that? You only have one or two choices. Give up the truth of God that's causing you to be persecuted or bear up under exercise, patience, endurance, perseverance, and keep on doing what you know is right. And of course, that's what the Bible says that we ought to do. So we're talking about what is a character trait of a faithful child of God, of a Christian, a member of the Lord's body, a brother or sister in the family of God, a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. We've often said that living the Christian life is building your character in the likeness of Christ. This ought to tell us something about the design and purpose of life in the flesh in this world where the devil has access to us to try to get us to violate God's will, to gratify the appetites of the flesh, even if it means violating the will of heaven. How could we ever build up endurance if we didn't have to endure? If you're a weightlifter, you know that you have to basically break down muscles and make them stronger. You're never going to lift 200 pounds if you can't lift 100 pounds, but you can get from one to the other, but it takes endurance. It takes patience. It takes steadfastness, and you continue to work at it. Sometimes it can be rather painful. So when it comes to building up your inner man, your spirit, the real you that'll continue on with your old fleshly body gone, then God has ordained a situation and a place where that can best be done. The devil has access to you. God has access to you. God appeals to your reasoning power, your intellect, your conscience with the word of God, trying to get you to think straight as to the fact that no matter how well you live in this life physically, it's going to end at some point or the other. But he doesn't mean that your existence ends then. It just means you leave this life and there is a, another life and you're going to be in heaven or hell based on how you live this life. And in order to be in heaven, you must endure persecutions that come upon you and the pressures we might say because and specifically that you're a Christian. So we're building character, a character trait. Now, what we're saying is, is that endurance or patience is a Christian character trait. 
We need to know, though, why. Underscore that word why. Why this is so important. Now, the rest of the sermon is going to be given over to what we're about to say. We're going to study some scriptures answering the question of why. Why is endurance, patience, and perseverance so important? So we want to see the importance of it and recognize that God has set up a situation where we can develop it by resisting Satan and he'll flee from us and even how we resist Satan. And we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to us, but how do we draw near to God? Of course, very quickly, you draw near to God by from the heart loving him and keeping his commandments, even when you're persecuted for it. So we see the why of it in continuing doing what we know is right. Now I'm back to where we started in Hebrews 10, verse 36. Endurance then is a positive character trait. People talk about positive this and positive that. Well, a positive character trait is patience or endurance or, or perseverance. But the question is, what do we do endure? We're to endure doing the will of God under any and all circumstances. Notice that having done in the passage implies that we want to complete the work we started. But it's not completed until this life is over. Listen to what is said in the last book of the New Testament. Again, read to Christians. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. John says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Now, you know that the book of Revelation was actually written to those who were being persecuted for righteousness' sake. It was to encourage them. It was to strengthen them, even as the book of Hebrews, for the Jewish Christians who were thinking about giving up the New Testament system and going back under Judaism. So endurance carries with it the idea of finishing the course, of finishing what one has begun. In this case, continuing to do the will of God as long as we live and are able on this earth. That's the whole idea. It may be 30 years, maybe 50 years, maybe 70 years, however long it is. Some people never get to be 20. Some people never see 30. But if you're a child of the living God, as the Bible defines and uses that phrase, that expression, then you do what God said, the way he said do it, and for the reason he said do it, let come what may. Now we're to endure because we're to bear fruit. The Bible has a lot to say about Christians bearing fruit. I've seen some people limit the fruit bearing to just how many people have you converted to Christ. The Bible isn't so limited. In Luke 8, 15, notice what he said to those who learn the truth and live the truth and would not stop living the truth. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, verse 11. Then he says, but that on the good, good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, now watch what he says, and bring forth fruit with patience, endurance, perseverance. If the parable of the soils or in the parable of the soils, only one soil or state of mind or heart brought forth fruit called the good soil, the good and honest heart. So again, I say fruit is what we produce, in this case, in faithful service to God. Now to do this, we must abide in Christ. We must abide in Christ. Well, you can't abide in Christ unless you get into Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 
lets it be clearly known that we are baptized I-N-T-O, into Christ. The person that has been brought to belief in Christ through the word of God, Romans 10, 17, who has repented of sins, Acts 17, 30, and confessed one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, the complete obedience of the gospel, that person is immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. The Lord adds that person to the church, Acts 2, 47. And he endures in the church, the family of God, in doing what God charges the church to do to be faithful to him. Again, I say most of the letters of the New Testament are written to Christians to keep them enduring. Notice what he said in John, or rather in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. Again, writing to the church in Colossae. He says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You can't do one without the other. Jesus had said in his ministry in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, except ye abide in me. Remember the vine and the branches? He's the vine, we are the branches. Except ye abide in me then you cannot bring forth fruit. You cannot live the godly life. So endurance is needed in order to bear fruit in our service to God. Notice that bearing fruit has to do with helping others. James 1 verse 27 talks about benevolence. And he says plainly that taking care of the widows and orphans and keeping oneself unspotted from the world is to practice pure and undefiled religion. So you see, that's more than teaching people the gospel, having them hear it, understand it, and obey it. Certainly that's part of it. We'd like to see more of it. But there's far more to being a faithful child of God than just that. There's so much involved in the component parts of the whole Christian. Then we're to persevere because we want to be perfect. When we say perfect, we mean spiritually complete in the Lord. James had this to say to Christians. By the way, they're basically the same Jewish Christians that is addressed by the Hebrews writer. He said in James 1, 4, but let, listen to him. This is our subject. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, if you want to live faithful to the Lord, here's how you do it. You keep on doing what's right, even when you're persecuted for it. We endure through the trials of our faith, the testing of our faith. James right here in the verse preceding this one, verse 3 in James 1, says, knowing this. Here's something I need to know and you need to know. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, your confidence, your belief, your trust in God and the gospel system works patience, works endurance, works perseverance. Now, most of the time we want the easy route. We get beside ourselves when a problem arises in the church. We wring our hands rather than look at it as a challenge to lift a heavier weight and to build up this character trait that's so needful if we're to build up the trait of Christ in our lives. James 1, backing up another verse, to verse 2, we looked at 4, we looked at 3, now look at 4. James wrote, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means different kinds of, of testing, of your faith being tested. Count it all joy. I don't see Christians counting it joy many times when they have a struggle, when they have to stand for the truth, when they have to deal with apostate brethren, they wring their hands again. I don't know what they do in prayer uh, when they petition the Father for strength and lay every care and burden on him through Christ. But this is what the Word of God says, and it'll read the same way and mean the same way on the day of judgment when we stand before the judgment bar of God. Now, notice what is said. Concerning the example, the pattern we have to look to and follow 
and that is Jesus Christ. The Hebrews writer, remember what we said about the reason for the writing of the letter of the Hebrews, in Hebrews 2 and verse 10, says this of Christ, for it became him. Let's stop right there for a moment. Have you ever told somebody, and truly meant it, that your suit or your dress becomes you? Well, what became Christ? For it became him, the inspired writer of the Hebrews said, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. What became him? And bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation. Watch it. Perfect. That means spiritually complete. How? Through suffering. Again, Hebrews 2.10. We don't like to recognize the design and purpose of sufferings in the flesh or being persecuted for righteousness' sake or keep on doing good when the good brings trouble to us. But that's the design and purpose of this life is to show God we love him. We're coming to the end of this life at some point or another, and then comes the end of time and the end of this whole physical, material system of things, and then the judgment when we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. I dare say that those particular uh, problems that we bore up under will seem very much then when we stand before him. Christians must learn then to view sufferings because of obedience to Christ in the way Christ viewed sufferings brought upon him and obedience to God that was necessary to save our souls. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise in the same mind. You have the same mind of Christ regarding sufferings? Peter says we must. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. That is the purpose, practice, habitual doing of sin. Notice he continues that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Again, 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. So what are we saying? You know what God wants you to do? You say you love him. You say you have faith in him based on that word. You take him at his word. But then when the times get tough because you're doing what he said to do and the way he said to do it for the reason he said to do it, or sometimes there's more than one reason, then you want to throw up your hand and say, oh, woe is me. Why me? Why did this happen to me? Well, we're learning, aren't we? If we're studying the Bible and seeing the revealed mind of Christ. Endurance is needed in order to, to be perfect or spiritually complete in Christ. We also see that we're, we're to undergo these things. That is, we're to exercise patience or steadfastness or be or to endure to develop character. I've said that several times already, or at least referred to it. Paul wrote to the church in Rome along these lines. Chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. Verses 3 and 4, at least through the first part of verse 4. Romans 5, 3, and the first part of verse 4. He said to those brethren of long ago, and thus in writing the New Testament to us also, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, do we? We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience worketh endurance, worketh perseverance. Like I say, if you're lifting weights, you're not going to lift 200 pounds if you can't lift 100. But you want to lift 200 pounds. So you work through it gradually, and you keep, keep lifting more and more till you reach the goal. Then he goes ahead and says, in patience, experience, and experience, hope. Now, hope is what faithful Christians have a right to expect when life is over, and you have that earnest desire to receive it. That's how we're saved by hope, Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Now, let me go and read it all together. 
And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You ever been ashamed of anything in your life? Have you ever been ashamed of others for the way they lived or didn't do? I think we all have. The point being here is that are you ashamed of being a Christian when you're persecuted for righteousness sake because you are a Christian? Paul says, you know the way to get over that? You go through the tribulation because it builds patience and that works through the experience of doing right under difficult circumstances. And that experience builds up your expectation of heaven. You can look beyond by the eye of faith, by the word of God, all the troubles of this life, and you see what's waiting on you. Tribulation brings perseverance or patience, James 1, 2, and 4. And this brings proven character. We read James 1, 2, and 4 a little while ago, 2 through 4, in fact. Now, you know that many claim to be faithful. It's sort of like reading an obituary. No telling what kind of life some people live, no matter how hard it is. But some way or another, somebody says, rest in peace. Well, most people don't rest in peace. They're like the rich man. When they die in torments, they lift up their eyes. Well, the writer said in Proverbs 20, verse 6, most men will proclaim every one his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Well, what proves that a person is genuinely a righteous person, a faithful person? Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. Again, he's writing to Christians. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That's trials. How do I know that? We'll read the next. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Again, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. Well, how valuable to the faithful these truths are. Endurance is needed to develop godly character, and it truly demonstrates that we are who we claim to be. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord? Well, that's a good beginning to acknowledge him as Lord. But then he says, and do not the things which I say. We're interested in doing the things that he says once we've called him Lord, Lord. But why patience? Why the need of endurance to run the race before us? Listen again to the inspired Hebrews writer. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now watch it. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Now what's interesting is what's found in Hebrews chapter 11. It is inspiration's hall of fame for faithful obedience to God. He selects by inspiration, selects for the writer, all these Old Testament worthies who never were under the New Testament. And yet they were faithful, they endured, they were patient under the law God gave for them. And he says, now they're in the audience now, as it were, and they're rooting for you. And that's basically the idea when he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let's do our duty as the word of God puts it before us today. Let's discharge our obligations, let come what may, even as they did under lesser truths than what we have. 
we've all heard of marathons, especially in the Olympics. We have these different cities every year having these hundreds and hundreds of people come to run in their various races. Christian life is a race, according to the scriptures. And you know, in a race, only one comes in first. Only one. And that's the attitude that ought to exist in every Christian. And I'm going to win the race. So we must look to Jesus, who did not, in doing what he had to do to save us from sins, who did not grow weary, who did not lose heart. In Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, these words are written to encourage those Jews who had become Christians and to stop them from leaving the New Testament system. Listen to what it said. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father on high. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your hearts. Let me ask you this. What did Jesus allow to come between him or to hinder him or to stop him from doing the Lord's will so he could save us? What is the great demonstration of his love for us when we didn't even deserve it? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Jesus and God so loved the world that he did what he did. Now, notice the endurance of Christ. You look at him in the Garden of Eden. Did he want to go to the cross as a man? He did not. But he loved doing the will of God more than having his own will. So he said, not my will, but thine be done. We run with endurance, and that's the point. You look at these people racing, and look at the training they put themselves through, and look at them at the end of the race, and look how they have driven themselves through practice, and sometimes they just pass out after they cross the finish line. Wherefore, seeing we are also accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Hebrews 12, 1. We must be diligent in all that the word diligence means. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize, Paul asks. Then he tells us, so run as Christians that ye may obtain. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Also, obedience, now watch it, obedience to the rules God has given us that governs our race, our Christian race. He said to Timothy, that young preacher, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet he's not crowned, except he strive lawfully, That's what we need to understand, 2 Timothy 2.5. There are a multitude of people out there doing what they think is right today. Why, here's Easter Sunday. You can't read of it in the scriptures. It's not there. Nothing is authorized in the scriptures for Christians to celebrate the birth of Christ or the resurrection of Christ in the way that people do. Now, they do have teaching the Bible to remember his death in the Lord's Supper. They won't do that when the Bible says upon the first day of the week, Acts 27, in the assembly of the saints. But what do they do? They do what they please. Easter and Christmas exist because people want it their way. That's true of any human religion. Human religions exist so people can have it their way. You go to your church, I'll go to mine, we all get to heaven together. Doesn't really make any difference what you believe, you so you're sincere. You never read that in the Bible. You never see that talk. So we need to be mindful to know that endurance is needed to run the race and not grow weary or lose heart, but to stay with things according to the rules God set out in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3, 16, and 17. We're to be patient because we want to receive what God's promised the faithful. 
For ye have need of patience, the writer of Hebrews said. Endurance. That after you've done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. That's the verse we started with. God offers a reward to motivate us to endure until the end. That's an eternal inheritance. It does not end. And for this cause, speaking of Christ, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they that are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.15. Look around you. Everything you can experience through your five senses, including your body that has your senses, is going to cease. All material creation is going to go away. But for you, even if it's continuing on, since it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment, when you die, you step completely out of this whole realm of things and the way it's done. The one who endures until the end is going to be saved. Matthew 24, 13. We're taught then in the book of Revelation that if you must give up your life rather than violate the word of God, then do that. Revelation 2 then, be thou, 2.10, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Endurance is needed so that we can receive the promised reward of eternal life. Now, how are you from this point forward going to view tribulations that come upon you because you're faithful to God? How are you going to even deal with the tribulations that are part of all of us because we're humans in the flesh and the weakness of the flesh? Are any of these things capable of removing you from doing what you know God's word says? God, uh, Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? The book of Revelation summed up is, as we've said many times, and you know, the message of the book is faithful Christians win. It doesn't make any difference what happens. The faithful win. You shall receive a crown of life. God has given us the opportunity to be saved from our sins. And once saved from our sins, be saved in heaven if we persevere, if we are patient in well-doing. But we must have that endurance in order to be saved. As we bring the lesson to a close, starting down the right path is a must. It's imperative. It's obligatory. But we must continue down that path, let come what may. There can be no turning back. There can be no ceasing to do what we know the Bible says Christians are to do. In Hebrews 10, 38, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So we must have enough confidence, trust, faith, belief in God and his system of salvation to endure doing what's right, because it is right, and there is no other place. Remember, Jesus said one time, will you also go away? Some had left him because they didn't like his teachings. Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. Well, if you leave the Christian life, if you leave what the New Testament says, where are you going to go? But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, the writer of Hebrews said but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And that involves patience or endurance in doing what's right in the face of adversity, privation, and persecution. So we conclude by simply saying, don't grow weary and lose heart. Don't become weary in well-doing, as the Bible defines that well-doing. For in due season, you might say, if we're patient, if we endure, we shall reap if we faint not. We keep looking to Christ and following him in the only way that we can through the knowledge of the truth. So we continue in the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, knowing that when we do so, complete our life as a faithful child of God, heaven will be our home. Now, there may be someone who wants to obey the gospel. Maybe someone who sees that the way they're living is contrary to the will of heaven. They may want to use their lives in service to God. 
Well, God stands ready to save you when you humble yourself, believe the truth, and obey it as we've studied in this sermon. And if you would like to obey the gospel, then you can contact us and we'll do what we can to help you in obeying the gospel and being baptized into Christ. As a child of God, have you learned from this lesson? Have you sort of said, well, I really don't want to undergo all this trouble that comes by living the Christian life? Well, you need to repent of that. Because you see, if you listen to this study and study with us from the Bible, endurance, patience is essential to building the Christian character that will take us into glory. You need to confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever way we can help you, then just contact us if you need, and we'll do our best to do the same. So we invite you to obey the gospel whenever you have the opportunity, and today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. We thank you for being with us at this time. We bid you a good day.